Waltham, a small city located outside of Boston, Massachusetts, contributed greatly to the industrial history of the United States. In 1812, Francis Cabot Lowell built and established the first American factory, the Boston Manufacturing Company. The history of Waltham is basically inextricably linked to the industrial history of North America. What identifies industrialization per se um, is the idea that you can start with absolute raw materials on one end of an operation and within one building, within one sort of set of processes, come out on the other end with a finished product. And that happened for the first time in Waltham. In 1812, the Boston Manufacturing Company opened in Waltham along the Charles River by Francis Cabot Lowell. The, um, the Boston Manufacturing Company was sort of the Silicon Valley uh, of its day. It was like, it was like Apple computer and they, um, they made cloth. While the Boston Manufacturing Company was an important first step in the industrialization of the United States, there was another factory that went into operation in Waltham during the early 1850s, which ended up contributing far more to both the development of American industry and American history throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. There's another up-and-coming up factory that will be almost as great, maybe even greater, than the cotton, the, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and that was a watch factory. The central founder of the watch factory was a gentleman named Aaron Dennison. Um, Dennison got his early experience with mechanization, fine, precise mechanization that it takes to make watches, working for the U.S. Army, um, and he applied what he learned there in the 1840s to the development of watches in the early 1850s. Waltham Watch Company uh, opened in Boston. Its original name was the uh, Boston Watch Company. It opened in 1850. It moved to Waltham in 1854. The location in, in uh, Boston, it was too dusty and it was too small. The dust created problems with the precision machinery and putting together these very finely tuned watches. So Aaron Dennison came looking for an area that was free of dust and would be a great place to set up his factory. And in 1854, he found the spot on the Charles River. The presence of the river provides a stream of air that's almost constantly moving, and so it keeps dust out of the parts without having to come up with some contraption that removes it. The watch factory was not the first place in the world to assemble and produce watches, as watchmakers in countries such as Switzerland and England had been producing watches prior to the 19th century. However, each European watch was individually made. All the Swiss watches and the English watches were made by, by individual parts. You couldn't take a part from one watch and put it in another watch. They were all individually made by files and, and, and emery cloth and, and carving and so forth. Aaron Dennison's dream was to make watches by machines, and so great men and women would come to Waltham to his new factory, like Charles Vanderward made the automatic screw machine, what turns out all these small screws you see in the parts of a watch. There's 156 parts to a Waltham watch, and uh, each part had to be made by one special machine. Every one of the 156 parts had 30 little processes to make it perfect and interchangeable with all the other parts. The assembly line process used at the Waltham Watch Factory was a new innovation as it was the first time any factory in America or in the world used this approach in producing a finished product from raw materials. For the first three years during its operation, the factory flourished. Unfortunately, however, despite Aaron Dennison's innovation of a quality product, the factory suffered from the economic troubles of 1857. There was a major depression in America in 1857, uh, that was the Panic of 1857. The watch factory uh, was bankrupt and it was auctioned off and a New York businessman named Royal Robbins purchased the factory and under his leadership the factory took off. Royal Robbins was able to make the watch factory, which at first was renamed Appleton Tracy and & Company and shortly thereafter the American Watch Company into one of the most successful American factories during the 19th century. Two important events in American history that took place after the change of ownership assisted the watch factory in blossoming, the arrival of the American railroads and 
most notably the American Civil War. It really rose uh, dramatically um, under the direction of uh, its longtime president, Royal Robbins, um, because they were able to sell watches uh, to the U.S. Army during the Civil War. Someone had approached them with the idea of making an inexpensive watch that they could sell to these soldiers, you know, in the Civil War, the Northern soldiers. So, so they came up with the William Ellery model. William Ellery was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. The soldiers needed to have timepieces. Um, it's always a lot better to conduct um, military maneuvers when your timing is accurate. And so it was important to get watches into the hands of the soldiers. The watch factory uh, managed to do that uh, because of its ability to do assembly line production it could reduce the cost of the watches to where people could afford to send them off to the, the war. To have a watch was a big deal. That gave the Union a huge mechanized advantage over the Confederacy. You could synchronize everything. I think that's a fundamentally crucial element of what made the, the Civil War the first mechanized war in global history. It's not just the guns. It's the precision tools with, with which you actually prosecute war. The role the watch factory played in the American Civil War helped the Union achieve victory over the South. Even Abraham Lincoln owned a Waltham watch. Along with this great contribution to the country, the watch factory also helped the railroading industry by producing railroad watches. The mass production of these watches contributed greatly to the safety and improvements of the railroads. By the time Waltham came into business, the railroads were just starting to go. And that was another need that, that developed. Because these railroads, they shared track. Waltham actually made the first watch specifically for the railroad, which was the Crescent Street model, 1870 Crescent Street. The highest grade railroad watch Waltham made was the Vanguard. The watch had to be open face, like this. And they had to have, have uh, clear, Arabic numerals like this. Lever setting, you have to actually physically open the bezel and there's a little lever. See the little lever sticking out? And then you can move the hands back and forth. And then when you get to the correct time, you put the lever back in. That was a feature that was required on railroad watches because what happens is they were afraid that the stem might pull out when it was in the conductor's pocket. With all the contributions the watch factory was making to the progress of America, the reputation of the factory grew and became well known throughout the country and the world. Beginning with the marketing of watches to Union soldiers and railroad men, the watches began being bought by the common American man and became one of the most popular American products to own. With the revenue being generated from the sales of these watches, the factory was able to undergo a major rebuilding and renovation that turned it into a structure unlike any other around the country. Originally, the Waltham Watch Company was made of concrete. It's the first building in America to be made of concrete, the first factory. And the problem with concrete is it crumbles. It was uh, rebuilt uh, with brick. And it's an interesting design. It's a, it's a wonderfully designed building, a lot of nice architectural features. The building is very unusual in that it's very, very narrow front to back, but is very long. And, and each of the wings is designed the same way. And it's a magnificent structure architecturally. It, I believe it was the largest contiguous space in the world for something like 50 years. It was the largest watch factory in the world. So these high vaulted ce ceilings, these huge windows that set right on the river. It's sort of idyllic. The windows had to be high because they let so much light in um, so that you could actually look at the watch parts and really do this before uh, electrical light. The, the high windows allow you to open them and get fresh air moving through. Uh, the high ceilings allow hotter air to collect at the top, the cooler air is at the bottom so it doesn't affect the metals and the watches as much. It really was an elegantly conceived structure. Um, it somehow seamlessly balances things that human beings need with what the actual process of manufacture needs to achieve. I would imagine compared to these very dark, dim, low ceiling, hot, anthrax ridden, cotton manufacture buildings that you find all over New England that were everywhere then, this place must have looked like a castle. The design of the building, which respected the workers with its clean and healthy work environment, 
was not the only benefit the watch factory had to offer employees. Dating back to the years of Aaron Dennison, the factory had always provided its workers with numerous benefits, many of which were never before offered in other American factories. Dennison was a devout Swedenborgian Christian. That meant basically that he treated his laborers incredibly well. Um, Swedenborgians believed deeply in acts of charity. Dennison's religiosity really affected how he ran the company. Even though it was a short tenure, I think that it was probably impossible for Royal Robbins to backtrack and remove the rights that had been given to those workers. It was a very paternal company. Uh, you worked for Waltham Watch, you probably lived in Waltham Watch Company housing, and your recreation was Waltham Watch also. So it was considered an excellent company uh, to work for. They offered, for that period of time, high wages. They had all kinds of benefits. They had uh, company boarding houses. They had company sports teams company picnics. And they also had a babysitter's place where you could, mothers could leave their babies. They had a, a club called the Riverside Club. Inside the Riverside Club there was a gym, there was a bowling alley, there was a cafeteria, uh, there was a pool. Effectively no other factory had operated in this way. And in part when the watch factory opened, I think this was because the laborers were, were almost all Yankees. The labor was highly specialized. To make watches, you have to have tremendous skill, even for the smallest of tasks. And I think that really affected how they were treated. The benefits were greater at the factory than at any other operation in the country. They had health benefits uh, long before almost any corporation or company in, in American history. It was very progressive, but definitely also of its time. Another interesting benefit the company offered was company dormitories and housing set up near the factory. One of the most notable and primary dormitories was the Adams House, which still exists to this day. The dormitories offered clean rooms and meals to the watch factory employees. By the turn of the century, the watch factory, which by this time had been renamed the American Waltham Watch Company, had become one of the greatest companies in both the United States and the world. During the American Centennial Exposition of 1876, the watch factory won the top prizes for precision manufacturing. With the popularity of both the watches and the factory, the city of Waltham became known as Watch City. Its assembly line process set the standard for industrial production and attracted the attention of soon-to-be industrial tycoons such as Henry Ford, whose tour of the watch factory inspired his use of the assembly line in automobile manufacturing. At the end of the 19th century, the greatness of the watch factory and its ability to make things by machines spread throughout all industries in the United States and paved the way for the great industrial power of the United States in the 20th century. The watch factory was bringing in a huge amount of specialized labor and it was turning it over very quickly. And there's a direct correlation between that turnover of employees and the rise of the rest of post-war American industry after the Civil War. Um, those employees were hired out from the watch factory by new companies popping up everywhere around the country because they were seen as the most specialized technicians a factory could employ. And they effectively went out around the country and spawned the growth of American industry. Despite the popularity of the Waltham watches, the golden age of the factory sadly came to a close after the turn of the century. For a number of reasons and issues that arose during the early 20th century, both inside and outside the factory, the factory began to decline, and its demise came about in the 1950s. Waltham went out of business for whatever reason, we don't really know. I mean, there were a lot of issues, everyone has an opinion. It was just a change in lifestyle, I think. Eventually, they all went to uh battery-driven watches and the, the majority of the gears and wheels left and the battery was doing the running of the watch. It began to decline after Royal Robbins passed away. Beginning in 1900, really beginning with the, the changing of hands, the Waltham Watch Company begins to suffer a pretty perceptible decline. They mismanaged it. They did not have the discipline that Dennison did. They also didn't seem to have the force of personality that Royal Robbins had. Much of the company's early success was owed to its technological advantage. 
And as the company became successful, uh, just like any business, there was new competition. So you had the Elgin Watch Company out in Illinois. You had the Hamilton Watch Company in Pennsylvania. The advantage that Waltham had technologically really it began to disappear. There was a bad strike at Waltham in 1924. The workers ended up coming back in 1925. During World War II, Waltham went into war production. Waltham had a slogan, uh, production for victory only. Everything during the 1940s went into war production. The war came to an end. Waltham had to retool and get into the civilian watch business, something the Swiss had really moved into the market during the 1940s, and Waltham was never able to catch up. There was an awful lot of political unrest and dissatisfaction with Europeans making watches and sending them over here. President Eisenhower even stepped in at one point to try and help out. More and more people would be losing their, their jobs. And when you take a factory the size of the Waltham Watch Factory and you reduce the amount of space that's actually being used to produce watches, it becomes more, um, more sad in, in a way uh, because it, it, it just seemed to be um, dying a slow death. It was still a source of incredible pride for the city. It was still used as an example for American industry. With its contribution to the history of American industry, the legacy of Waltham's watch factory lives on in Waltham residents and in watch historians and collectors everywhere. The legacy of the factory can still be seen and heard around Waltham, which will always be the watch city. The massive, beautiful structures along the Charles River that house the factory still exist to this day and have been saved and preserved by Berkeley Investments. When looking back at the history of the Waltham Watch Factory, it's amazing to see how the visions of Aaron Dennison, Royal Robbins, and the others involved with the development of the machinery and inventions associated with the Watch Factory contributed and helped shape American industry and the history of the United States of America.